Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today, we have a first-time guest on our show. He started Freedom Fest. He's an investor. He's an author. He's an accomplished professor. He's made a lot of money on Wall Street, and his name's Mark Skousen. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Hey, my pleasure. Great. Now, Mark, in your opinion, uh, is either political candidate or their corresponding political party capable of fixing the U.S. economy and putting the country back on the right track? Oh, yeah. As an economist, I recognize that there are marginal differences that can have a major impact, and Romney is clearly the better candidate than President Obama, especially for investors. Uh, he will maintain the low rates that were pushed through into the Bush administration. And, you know, investors, we investors fought long and hard for some kind of tax relief on uh, interest and dividends and capital gains, and that will be maintained under, uh, under a Romney plan. So while Romney is not a revolutionary or anything like that, I do think he will turn the economy around and will do a better job just like Reagan did after Jimmy Carter. That, that's very interesting, and I, I think we, we have a really bad divergence here in this country with an attitude where the, the country just believes that, you know, Romney already has money, and, you know, we used to have, we used to value success and hard work and people achieving things in the private sector, and here, you know, someone with like Romney with his credentials who has success in the private sector and has turned companies around, yes, he's trimmed fat, yes, he has cut jobs, but he's also created jobs, and he's done things efficiently, which is something that the mainstream media never talks about, and just the American population doesn't, or a large percentage of it, doesn't respect someone like Romney who has, you know, a very long list of accomplishments just like yourself. Yeah, I think there's uh, – people have a little bit mixed feelings regarding wealthy people. They like them, but they dislike them. <laughs> there's kind of a, a love-hate relationship that seems to exist. Uh, the American people, we all believe in the American dream, but we also have an incredible envy uh, the wealthy, and this is why the Democrats are constantly bashing the rich and think they can get away with it and get support because of that envy factor. And it's really too bad because Romney has been pretty successful all of his life and a turnaround specialist and, uh, uh, and on net basis of job creation because that's what private equity does. Uh, so, And I think he did a decent job uh, dealing with the Democrats in Massachusetts. He made some mistakes. You know, you have to understand, of course, that business people are notorious uh, in terms of their uh, questionable understanding of basic economics. And you can see that with uh, with uh, Romney and his bashing of the Chinese and, and how we've lost manufacturing jobs, his failure to understand the basics of free trade. Although I, I do like uh, the, what he said about Latin America and opening up more trade there, but the idea of uh, closing down the, the Chinese uh, uh, economic miracle is is going to have grave repercussions if he follows through on that as president. Yeah, and the, one of the main things about you know Romney's China comments is that he's making it like the Chinese central bank in China is the only one devaluing their currency. I mean, we're in currency wars right now, and isn't the Fed trying to devalue the U.S. dollar massively against all the other currencies because the Federal Reserve and the politicians and some of the Wall Street mainstream Keynesian economists think that will help create jobs? Yeah, it's, a, it's a contest, <laughs> no doubt about it. Who can, who can inflate the fastest? And they're getting away with it because of this uh, global economy, which is expanding the uh, uh, amount of goods and services being produced. Uh, and it's hard for the central bankers to keep up uh, with the market forces of deflation, if you will. Uh, however, there's no question that uh, Ben Bernanke uh, is attempting, and the Federal Reserve is attempting, a deliberate policy of inflation, which in the short term is bullish. It will create higher earnings for most companies and uh I was talking to Ron Barron of the Barron uh, Fund, and he has an annual conference here, and he was talking about how how bullish he was on the stock market because of the Fed policy. He thought that Bernanke was some kind of a saint uh, by engaging in this actions and not realizing that uh, there's no free lunch even in monetary policy, and you have to pay the price. And, 
and you can have artificial prosperity initially, which is what we have right now, uh, but it, it must uh, inevitably end badly at some point down the road. Yeah, I, I think the Fed's goal is to keep try and keep the market propped up on at least a nominal basis for as long as they can. And, you know, from a tax perspective, that also helps them because if the market were to crash, you know, 20, 30 percent, then uh, the U.S. government's tax rates would drop, and the Fed doesn't want that either. So I think that's part of the reason why they pump the money into the system, and they, you know, they take the toxic assets off the bank balance sheets, and then they give the Wall Street banks more free money to speculate with and to prop up the market. Yeah, it's great for the banks, and I've actually been quite bullish on the financial, uh, uh, financial markets uh, in the stock market. We have quite a few positions in that. Uh, because of that, but you know, it's a short-term thing, and it's uh, they certainly look better on their balance sheet. Uh, but they're not really making uh, the the loans to small business, which is what normally creates jobs and genuine prosperity. They're just playing the yield curve and <clears throat> investing this cheap money in in treasuries and uh, uh, mortgage government guaranteed mortgage uh, uh, mortgages. So it's not uh, it's not you know, it has the appearance of um, prosperity, but it's it's pretty artificial in a lot of ways. It, exactly, and the banks, you know, are not doing the normal old three six three of uh, borrowing three percent, lending out at six percent, and going to the golf course by uh, by three p.m. <laughs> They're not good. doing that. Yeah, that's uh, banking used to you know be a very very boring job, pretty simple. You know, you used to weigh the credit risk and. Uh, the Wall Street banks and the large banks used to grow Main Street USA businesses, and that's when Wall Street and Main Street together worked together and everyone prospered. And there's just a big dislocation like that now because now Wall Street makes its money not really lending to Main Street anymore. They make their money well, uh, they make their money on credit cards, but and student loans, but they make the majority of their money now like. Uh, playing the yield curve, like you said, front, front running the Federal Reserve, trying to guess which asset the Fed's going to buy uh, next on the next quantitative easing or stimulus program, and then uh, speculating on uh, in the commodities markets, the stock market, and all the other uh, markets. Yes, I agree. Okay, well, what do you think that the end game is then for uh, – this this monetary system because I, I've heard from other experts they think the monetary system then essentially died in 2008 2009 it was a zombie and the Fed's just been printing money and doing whatever it can you know jawboning the markets to keep confidence in the dollar and keep going um will all these QEs are they going to be able to keep doing all of these QEs uh, for forever or are the foreign creditors and the bond market going to revolt at some point. Well, I think the the hope is that uh, that you're buying time, in essence. I mean, I'm not a conspiratorialist in terms of uh, the central banks, uh, kind of, uh, you know, conspiring to destroy the system. Uh, that I don't think that makes sense. That's their bread and butter. But what I do think the central banks are trying to do is to buy some time so that uh, <clears throat> the fiscal side of uh, government policy will get their act together and adopt austerity. They all have to adopt austerity. There's no question about it. That's the pressures that the uh, uh, economic uh, central bank in, in Germany is imposing on Europe. And no matter who's elected president uh, on November 6th, uh, austerity is the name of the game in the U.S. So uh, we have to reject the Keynesian model and, and turn things around. So uh, you know that's really what the end game is, and they think that by buying time and then adopting this austerity, the pressure will be relieved, and so they don't need to engage in any more uh, quantitative easing. Certainly, Mitt Romney gets in. Uh, Glenn Hubbard of the uh, the uh, business school at Columbia, uh, and and a friend of mine, uh, he, he's probably most likely going to be the new Fed chairman, and uh, I know his attitude is to uh, reject these QE, uh, Q eternities, as they're calling them. Yeah, it it, it looks like, um, if, if you're familiar with Ray Dalio and his beautiful deleveraging plan, that Ray Dalio thinks that uh, they can create nominal growth uh, by, you know, keeping the interest rates low and monetizing just a certain amount of debt. And he thinks, uh, he wrote this plan 
along with his other uh, Wall Street buddies for the Federal Reserve. And that's the plan to me that looks like being implemented, you know, a version of financial repression. And uh, that's uh, until, you know, the bond market or foreign creditors say enough is enough. I, I guessing that's the plan that's going to be uh, kept. Yeah, I agree. Okay, well, let's change topics here. You, you have a great track record of making predictions others don't see in the markets. What potential predictions or black swans do you see coming to fruition that Americans in the markets are not expecting? I do not see any black swans coming right now uh, uh, as far as the um, – I mean, we already know – the fiscal cliff, and I'm talking here about the unfinite liability problem that we've gotten our, ourselves into with uh, Social Security and Medicare that's going to be just building constantly that uh, could be a problem. But, you know, there's always the possibility of an unexpected uh, run on the dollar. I mean, we are deliberately uh, devaluing the dollar and creating inflation. <clears throat> and as the Austrians have pointed out, money is never neutral. And you create these asset bubbles. We've already seen how the real estate asset bubble uh, had macroeconomic effects, and that was really one of the first times in modern times it took the Chicago school by surprise because they'd always thought that, uh, that uh, a asset bubbles, uh, whether it's real estate or the stock market, or a certain manufacturing sector, just had microeconomic effects and didn't have a broad-based uh, impact, and they had to throw that model out the window in 2008. So, <clears throat> as far as black swan events, uh, that's that's the biggest danger is uh, is another uh, run on the dollar because we still have, despite all the regulations that are going on, we still have a global laissez-faire market. I mean, capital can move pretty quickly from one sector to another, and uh, when you have a kind of a leveraged, uh, still highly leveraged monetary system <clears throat> based on fractional reserves. Uh, it's all built on confidence. It's a confidence game. <clears throat> and uh, if that confidence starts deteriorating, uh, you could see a significant uh, black swan events. And um, you talked about that there's still capital flight, you know, allowed to move back and forth. The hot money is allowed to move back and forth. Do you, do you expect worsening capital controls then in the next five years, like globally, or do you think that uh, people are not going to, that central bankers and governments are not going to go back to making some of the mistakes they did in the 20s and 30s? Oh no, no, no. I mean, it's uh, whenever there's a crisis, that's an opportunity for government to intervene. They're not going to just sit back idly and allow these markets to uh, to collapse. So I see considerable uh, <clears throat> intervention on the part of central banks and treasury departments to keep that from happening. And there's already in place emergency powers that gives government the ability, the the right to go in and uh, and, and and to stop uh, uh, capital flows. Uh, so. Uh, uh, government's not going to. Government's going to use its powers in those kinds of situations. So this is why nobody should should sell their gold anytime soon or their silver because uh, when a system like that collapses, you're going to need uh, those kind of basic barter tools and and and, and tools and equipment and and so forth. And when you enter a survival mode. Exactly, and I completely agree with that, and I think you know, physical bullion is a very important insurance outside of the system, like you said. Now, like for fi actually fixing the U.S. and rebuilding the economy, like you said earlier in the interview that Romney will do things on the margin, but I, I want America to flourish again, like – better than 5% real GDP growth, not this nominal GDP growth, which isn't even counting the real inflation rate. So um, one of the reasons that will probably fix all this is if a viable third-party candidate get, gets elected. So what, what is your opinion uh, about the next presidential election? Do you think that the American people are ready to elect a viable third-party candidate in the election after this one, like a Ron Paul or a Gary Johnson? Absolutely not. It's not going to happen. They, they talk about intervention. There's already uh, considerable state uh, rules that that really discourage third parties. Yes, they get on the um, 
on the ballot, but uh, look at the presidential debates, the way that's set up. You have to have 15% in regular polling in order to qualify. This is why Gary Johnson and the other third-party candidates are not in these presidential debates. I mean, uh, <clears throat> Gary Johnson is uh, polling, uh, you know, 2 or 3%, uh, so he's he's not a big enough factor to get him – uh, like Ross Perot in, in the early uh, 90s. Ross Perot came the closest to really developing a third party, but it was more a third man rather than a party. <clears throat> so uh, uh, I don't see that happening yet. I don't know what catalyst uh, would actually do that other than, uh, okay, we've tried Obama, that that worked, that failed, uh, Romney. Now we're trying Romney and he failed. Maybe there could be a point where people are uh, – disillusioned with both political parties but right now i just from the vested interest of individual americans uh, what would be the incentive i mean you promised this five percent real growth but uh, uh americans uh, just see that as fantasy okay very good and you know uh, on that laying the groundwork for eventual change in america you, you founded freedom fest so why did you found Freedom Fest, and are you finding more Americans are waking up to the truth about what's happening to the economy, to their personal freedoms, and to their corruption in government? Well, we're certainly getting a lot of publicity, and, and I've been talking to a lot of people about our Freedom Fest event uh, next year, which is uh, we're moving to Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas for the first time, and our theme is Are We Rome? And we we were, were, I mean, everybody I talked to, uh, I used to walk into a room and nobody would uh, say boo to me, and now I'm glad-handing all kinds of people because they've all heard of Freedom Fest. And, you know, it's it's a unique uh, concept, and it's actually, and it took years for us to develop, but my idea was, uh, uh, you know, we have to fight against this uh, her, herd of cats mentality of all going our separate ways, and as a result, we just have no in, real influence. Uh, and my idea is to bring together everybody physically into a conference once a year where we all gather and uh, there's strength in numbers and we can be a very powerful force. And, and you know, you talk about a third party movement, even though we're not a political party by any means, we're nonpartisan in that respect. Uh, who knows what could come out of this, the idea of uh, concentrating and coming together uh, where uh, the best and the brightest and everybody uh, who's concerned about uh, uh, this. Okay, so we can uh, – Mark, you you were talking about Freedom Fest again, and you're talking about all the wonderful discussions and all the, the people that are coming in from different backgrounds and all the different uh, valuable insights that they're bringing to the table and – the wonderful things that they could potentially come out of it. And you talked earlier before we started recording about how you said you're trying to build like a modern day Renaissance type of thing. So can you talk a little bit more about Freedom Fest? Yeah. So the idea behind Freedom Fest, and it is a unique idea because everybody has their own conferences and their own events. And uh, it's like a herd of cats, you know, can you bring everyone together? And so it's kind of like the focal point idea of if, if there's a meeting place where you all meet, where would that be? And, of course, the answer is becoming more and more Freedom Fest. Everybody needs to show up, and we're growing very quickly, uh, several thousand people. You know, we started off with just 750 people, and now we have over 2,000 coming. And next year we're moving to Caesar's Palace, and our theme is Are We Rome? So... Uh, we're, we're growing, and we have an exhibit hall with all the uh, freedom organizations and the uh, free market think tanks like Cato and Reason and Heritage and so forth coming together. Um, it took a long time for people to realize this is something that we need to do uh, where, where we can all come together and have a central uh, concept, uh, and, and we can build from that. So it's a and, and it's a great opportunity to learn because, like you say, Renaissance gathering. So we talk philosophy and history and geopolitics and investments and healthy living and science and technology, even music and dance and so forth. There's a little bit of everything. And so we get a very good mixed crowd of wealthy investors, uh, intellectuals. Uh, uh, we, we bring an intellectual feast to Las Vegas uh, every year. So 
we're growing very quickly, and, and I hope uh, you, all your listeners can join us. If you go to freedomfest.com, you can find out what, what it is. We are a for-profit uh, uh, event, not a nonprofit, so we don't compete with any of the nonprofits. We don't do any fundraising. You just pay the price, and you come to the conference, and you can learn and network and socialize and celebrate liberty or what's left of it. Great. And, you know, something I'm hoping uh, I can make out of Freedom Fest in the next couple of years, and it's just not, not easy for most Americans to want to talk with other Americans about a lot of the topics that you guys cover at Freedom Fest. It's just not something that people want to speak about, you know, at the office, at the cocktail party, a lot of regular Americans, because, um, you know, some of the ideas that, that we discuss, that I discuss, like Austrian School Economics, it's not mainstream. The mainstream media doesn't like to talk about it. And it's just a really good place you've set up, a really great event for people who are allowed to speak freely and speak their mind. Because, you know, if you speak your mind sometimes to a lot of Americans who haven't woken up yet, uh, the, uh, the conversations can end very badly. And I've lost some friends, unfortunately, the last few years because of it. Well, that's true. Although I will tell you that uh, uh, we get a lot of uh, letters, uh, testimonials, if you will, from people who are not libertarians who come to the conference with an open mind, and they walk away saying, people were very civil with me, even though I'm not a libertarian, I learned a lot, and, you know, they were on their way. So we don't, we try to stay away from this uh, uh, name-calling and labeling and this uh, uh, uncivil discourse that you see on Fox News and MSNBC and so forth. Uh, we try to avoid left-right labels and things like that and, and treat everyone as an individual, which is what, uh, our, what the freedom movement is all about and what Austrian economics is all about. It's all about individual behavior uh, and, and what that means. And I mentioned one other thing. Steve uh, Forbes, who is uh, he and John Mackey of Whole Foods Market are our co-ambassadors, and they make a point of being there all three days. Now, there aren't very many conferences where people of that stature stick around for all three days. So that gives you an idea of how exciting this, this whole concept is. And, and Freedom Fest is a very unique event in that respect. Yeah, there's really nothing else like it. I mean, I've been a libertarian for a couple of years now, and you guys are by far the – the most well-known libertarian or um, even that type of thinking, like outside-the-box thinking, and you have all the big-name guests and you have all the good discussion panels and you have all my favorite Austro-libertarian investors too, like Doug Casey and Jeff Berwick and those guys. Oh, there yeah, too. they're always there, and we have great debates. Uh, we, we always have a dozen debates, and, and uh, the, the thing that's uh, really exciting about uh, Freedom Fest is that it's an open forum, and that's – one of the secrets to our success. So you don't have to wait to be a speaker at our conference. You can uh, contact us, and uh, if there's a, a session available or a panel you want to create, you contact us, and, and we make it happen. So uh, we have all these breakout sessions, and so that's what makes it very unique. Uh, instead of the top-down, this is more of a bottoms-up, uh, almost democratic approach and it's been very powerful because a lot of people, there's a lot of young people out there, new authors, uh, people who have something to say and contribute. And uh, you seldom hear from those people when you go to the, the, the big conferences. You know, it's always the big name. And we try to bring in uh, uh, people you've never heard of before, but they got a gr something to uh, contribute. Excellent. So it definitely sounds like uh, something that I would be very interested in. Um, as we ch switch topics here and wrap up the interview, um, can you tell our listeners about your new Social Security Pledge project? And then um, also tell our listeners about a little brief summary of a few of your books. And you talked about a new book that you're working on, too, that I think our listeners would really uh, like. Well, yes. Uh, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've, I've turned 65 uh, on October 19th, and so at that point I'm thinking of uh, signing up for Social Security. And actually in the early 80s, uh, I burned my Social Security card in protest of the state pension system, which I think is, uh, uh, is very defective, um, so, and, and for a lot of reasons. And so uh, the question is, what do you do with this Social Security money? I mean, you, you, you don't want to just turn it down, but uh, my idea is to use that money for – for good uh, for a good cause, you know, and it's limited. Um, in my case, about fifteen hundred dollars a month. 
But with online banking, you can simply uh, uh, give uh, uh, your uh, money to various causes, uh, whether it's to promote free enterprise by investing in the stock market or giving money to Cato or uh, or Reason Foundation uh, or to Austrian economics to promote, promote that with lazy fair books or whatever. A student scholarships to Freedom Fest. There's all kinds of possibility. It doesn't have to be just tax deductible charities. So if you go to freedomfestpledge.org, I talk about what you can do with that, and I think it'd be a great way to uh, I- increase. You know, a lot of wealthy Americans who don't need their Social Security, they don't know what to do with it. So that that's my idea there. As far as my books are concerned, uh, of course, I have uh, quite a few books where I've talked about. Austrian economics, and and uh, have a book called Investing in One Lesson, and my latest book is called The Maxims of Wall Street, which is the first and only collection of all the Wall Street sayings. And I've got some some good quotes from Ludwig von Mises in there, and some other Austrians. So people might like that, The Maxims of Wall Street. And then I am working on a new book that'll be coming out in a few months, being published by Laissez Faire Books. It's called A Viennese Waltz Down Wall Street, Austrian Economics for Investors. I've never believed that uh, uh, investing is a random walk down Wall Street, as Bert Macchiao, who's a friend of mine, has advocated, but rather that uh, it is a waltz, although sometimes, uh, you know, the question is, is it a Viennese waltz or, or is it a, a Tennessee waltz? And <laughs> I think uh, it can vary there, but uh, the whole idea of a boom-bust cycle and applying that to the markets is a very powerful concept, and I've used uh, Austrian economics uh, all these years to write my own newsletter, Forecasts and Strategies, which people can find if they go to my website, markscousin.com. And I've been writing my newsletter for 33 years since 1980, and I consider myself a survivor. And one of the reasons is because I've tried to apply what I've learned in Austrian economics. Excellent. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I've studied Austrian school economics, and I've looked at the conventional teachings. I I did MBA program for a little while, and I dropped out because I didn't want to learn Keynesian economics. I took a class, and it it didn't make any sense. And, you know, I just got tired of learning all the theories like the efficient market hypothesis and the capital asset pricing model oh, yeah. and the modern portfolio theory. And these types of theories, I mean, the markets are really not efficient at all. They they oscillate mostly, in my opinion, between, you know, central bank intervention, between greed and fear. And, um, you know, using the, the lens of the Austrian school in particular will really, really help people out of, from that perspective because it's always going to be contrarian because it's not going to be taught normally in the mainstream and by the majority of universities. Well, I think it's a tool. It's not the only tool. Uh, I use seasonality and technical indicators as well that have nothing to do with Austrian economics. Uh, and, and, you know, value investing uh, is a is a very powerful strategy that uh, – you, you can uh, combine with Austrian economics to look for uh, uh, individual cases. But a lot of times you have to look just at the individual company and uh, whether it has a – you have to make a prediction about the future. And so there is some uncertainty that's always in existence in the marketplace, even with the Austrian school. And if there's one thing that I be critical of the Austrian schools, they tend to be pessimists and they're always looking for the collapse – and they hardly ever take advantage of the boom phase of the uh, cycle. So uh, I think there's a lot to learn from the Austrian school, uh, and and to uh, you know, it's one of those areas that that uh, should generate a lot of interest. Very good. And I uh, just want to wish you, since you mentioned it earlier in the interview, a happy early birthday, Mark. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, you've been a wealth of information today for our listeners, and um, hopefully we can have you back on soon for another podcast interview. It would be my pleasure.